Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, welcome to our event, Gig Workers' Rights Across the Country. We're going to get started in just a couple of minutes um, as folks come in um, and we work through some, hopefully work through some video issues. Um, welcome. Thank you for being here. We're going to get started shortly. Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're going to get started in about one minute. Thank you all for being here. All right. Um, okay. Well, I think we're going to get started. So thank you, everyone. Welcome to our event on gig workers rights across the country. Um, my name is Samantha Gordon. I am Tech Equities Chief Program Officer, and I'm always really excited when we get to do an event about workers rights. I'm very happy to be here today and very happy to be joined by three really amazing panelists. Um, and I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves to you all shortly. Um, before we jump in, I I do try to make sure we always give an overview of who we are at Tech Equity and what we do for anyone that's new or joining our events for the first time. So Tech Equity, uh, we engage tech workers to take action on building an economy where everyone can benefit from the growth that tech has created. We really do that in three main ways. One, we do education, events like these, engagement, try and get people um, connected to campaigns in their communities. Um, second, we do public policy. So we work in partnership with community groups to develop a set of public policy priorities to help achieve our mission. And third, we do corporate policies and corporate practices. So we design guidance, models, standards when we're researching an issue or putting out um, new ideas on an issue, we try to provide a model that companies can take if they want to do the right thing voluntarily and proactively and hopefully make those changes overnight to support um, workers and their communities. So the two areas we focus on are housing and labor. Um, and again, just thank you all for being here today. Um, we love being able to do these events and are grateful to have been able to continue them throughout, you know, the junior year of the pandemic. And um, if you appreciate these events and and or the work we do at Tech Equity, I would encourage you to make a contribution um, that uh, helps us continue to exist. Um, and uh, for those of you that have already made a contribution or volunteered on a campaign or even just joined our list, we appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. A um, couple of quick housekeeping things. One, um, we follow a code of conduct at Tech Equity. Um, Herman, our community manager, who probably already was in the chat, um, will share that there. Basically just says, we try to create safe spaces for learning. We keep our chat open. Please, you know, don't be... Uh, don't be you know, rude to other people, <laughs> be respectful of other people's opinions. Um, and then I, I know most folks are familiar with this by now, but we will have time for Q&A at the end. Um, so if you have a question, please try to use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen that helps us make sure that we don't lose track of questions. And finally, we provide ASL interpretation at our events and wanna thank our interpreter, Cindy, for being here today and shouts out to Zoom. They've created uh, an interpretation button. So you can click that feature at the bottom of the screen if you want to use the ASL interpretation. Okay, so we just finished uh, the midterm elections. And in California, it feels funny to say, but it was almost a quiet year um, <laughs> doing the midterm elections in some respects, um, mostly in my mind, because things were so hot and heavy in 2020 for a variety of reasons, not least of which was Prop 22, um, which was a ballot measure here that was sponsored by Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, Instacart, Postmates, that legalized um, those companies' practice of classifying drivers as independent contractors, um, preventing them from, preventing the drivers from accessing benefits, minimum wage, basic protections that employer uh, employees have the right to. And it was an opportunity for the companies to try to um, 
avoid uh, following a state law that was passed called AB5, which clarified who's an independent contractor and who's an employee. And since that time, uh, the proposition passed, but it's been in the courts um, and the rideshare companies have tried to replicate that practice in other places throughout the US. Um, and much long before AB5, the state law or Prop 22, gig workers um, have been organizing and have continued to do so. Um, and so we're really here today to take stock of where we are um, two years post this proposition, both looking at you know what has happened, what's continuing to happen, what does this mean for gig workers? What does this mean for legislation? And what does that mean for worker power and tech more broadly? Um, so I want to have an opportunity for our panelists to introduce themselves to you all because they are fantastic. Um, so I'm gonna uh, have each of them just kind of talk about who they are, how they come to this work, and then we'll get into some questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with you, Sherry, if you could introduce yourself to everyone joining us today. I think you're muted, Sherry. Beautiful. Um, thank you so much, Samantha. Um, again, my name is Sherry Murphy. I am a social justice minister here in the East Bay. I just recently moved to Durham, North Carolina. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. Um, and I'm a former ad base worker. Wonderful. Welcome to California. I didn't realize that. Congratulations. Actually, Durham, yes. Durham. Oh, wonderful. Okay, okay. Um, and let's go over to Ken. I'm Ken Jacobs. I'm the chair of the UC Berkeley Labor Center. And I uh, have been doing, related to this, doing research uh, related to gig workers, uh, I don't know, for the last uh, four years and in, in relationships shift to this, uh, specifically research on Proposition 22 and uh, its impact. Wonderful. Thank you. And Laura. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. My name is Laura Padim. I uh, she her pronouns. I'm the director of work structures at the National Employment Law Project, which is a national ad uh, organization advocating for a just and inclusive economy where all workers have good jobs. Um, and I focus on the ways that employers structure work that allow them to avoid accountability as an employer and allow them to depress wages and working conditions. And one of the key work structures we focus on at NELP is when employers misclassify workers as independent contractors. Uh, the gig economy, we see that as an example of this, but certainly that this, uh, phenomenon is much broader than that. Great Absolutely. to meet you. Well, thank all, thank you to all three of you for being here. Um, I'm so excited to talk to you. So just to get us started, I'm going to bring us straight into questions. So, you know, gig work obviously has been a hot topic um, for a while now. And I think that it's pretty well understood now why these models can be problematic for workers and frankly, legally for companies, right? This hasn't been an easy road for them either. Um, and a lot of these companies we've seen with things like Proposition 22, we've seen them use resources and capital to try and change laws um, and en enshrine what they're um, hoping to do with their business models. So I'd like to start by just sort of setting the context of, you know, we're two years past Prop 22. Where does this law stand right now in California and kind of what's been happening? So I want to hand first to Ken, who um, leads a lot of this research and in particular has extreme expertise on how that things are going in California. I wonder if you could kind of get us up to speed on where this law stands, what's happening right now? Sure. <clears throat> so just to backtrack a, a, a drop on what the law does. Um, so I think people are aware, but in general, Prop 22, which uh, passed in uh, November of 29, no, 2020, uh, went into effect at the beginning of 2021, removes basic labor and employment protections in California for with app-based app drivers. So that includes protection under the California minimum wage law. Importantly, as we'll see in a second, uh, the right to workers' compensation insurance, unemployment insurance, paid sick leave, uh, anti-discrimination laws, and the gamut of rights and benefits that come with being an employee in the state of California. And it replaced those standards with a much lower 
kind of sub minimum wage and sub set of standards. In some areas, uh, it doesn't. It, it, there's no replacement. In other areas, it's a replacement with with something that is is much lower than would be required otherwise under California law, and that includes. Uh, so it, it set a minimum pay at 125% of the minimum wage, but did so in a way that doesn't take into account about a third of drivers' uh, driving time or working work time. Then it also set a, a reimbursement on mileage that is well below what drivers' actual mileage costs is and doesn't include many of the miles that they drive. So we estimated overall that the guarantee, the alternative guarantee in Proposition 22 was worth about $5.64 an hour. So once the, when the law went into effect, the Service Employees International Union brought a lawsuit uh, in state court uh, to have the law declared unconstitutional, and they challenged it on two basic grounds. One is that the California Supreme Court, uh, I mean, the, the California Constitution specifically gives the legislature the ability to govern over workers' compensation insurance. And so this initiative was not passed as a constitutional amendment. And so it is that unconstitutionally interfe interfered in something that is in the state constitution given to the uh, state legislature. Importantly, they, the initiative very specifically does not have severability for any of the benefits and uh, guarantees that are set in the law. So if that it is struck down based on workers' compensation, then the whole law is struck down. The second thing that was sued on was that there's a provision in the uh, initiative that would bar the legislature from passing any laws related to collective bargaining for drivers. And the argument by SEIU was that this was a violation of the single subject rule for uh, initiatives. That was heard in a uh, superior court in Alameda, the judge agreed with, the, uh, with SEIU, the petitioners, and uh, struck down Proposition 22, which then, of course, the companies immediately appealed. That The appeal will be heard in Superior Court on December 13th. So we still have a, a, a ways to go here. We'll have the Superior Court hearing. There'll be some time from that uh, to when they actually rule, and then presumably that will be uh, appealed to the, the Supreme Court. Just important to note, in the meantime, the cases, uh, you know, the state's case against Uber, Lyft, and company for unpaid uh, wages and, and benefits and past labor and employment violations prior to Prop 22 is still in place, and the companies could still owe billions of dollars uh, from those lawsuits from past violations. If Prop 22 is struck down, uh, then they would also owe are uh, potentially liable for significant violations that have taken place in the last uh, two years as well. So none of this is, re Prop 22 is not retroactive. Uh, so overall, I think we're still in a, in a place right now, we're waiting to see what the, what the courts are doing. But in the meantime, Proposition 22 is in effect. And uh, from the best evidence we have right now, drivers in fact are earning well below uh, the state minimum wage. There was just a recent study by uh, the the um, Equity Atlas working with Right Your Drivers United that estimated drivers were earning around uh, $6.20 an hour once you take into account full expenses and full driving time. So uh, the violations do uh, continue as we wait. Thank you. I mean, it's it's quite a yarn <laughs> what has happened uh, with this proposition and with these issues. So I think actually, Sherry, I'd love to hear from you. You know, you mentioned you were an app based uh, worker. I know you've organized lots of app based workers. What are you, you know, how, can you talk about how you kind of came to this work and what your experience has been sort of working with drivers, being a driver, what you're seeing on the ground? 
Yeah, thank you. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that I'm currently working with Gig Workers Rising, uh, which builds collective power um, and help workers uh, fight for dignity and respect. So I just want to shout out and give a, lo a lot of love to them. Um, so um, I actually also want to begin um, because as I mentioned before, I am a minister. And so I just wanna bring into the space, the ancestors of, um, of the land on which, I'm, on which we're sitting on today, which the, is the land of the Ohlone people, the initial stewards of the land before the genocide and occupation due to white supremacy. I also want to acknowledge uh, the enslaved people, the ones who helped build this nation, based on the historical economic expectation. And I also wanna bring in the other melanated folks, the uh, Latinx communities, the AAPI communities, immigrants, undocumented workers, um, other POCs and low income. I wanna thank them for their strength and resilience in protecting this land and building this nation. And I aspire along with other folks uh, for building a better America. I think it's really important. I do this very frequently because I think it's really important uh, to set the tone of this conversation as a basis for economic and racial violence and how it plays out in the app-based industry. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, I currently work um, uh, with Gig Workers Rising, um, but before then I worked three years um, as a Lyft driver. Uh, it was my primary source of income. I had driven over 12,000 rides and I was in my last year of my master's of divinity and beginning to start my doctoral program um, back then in 2017. I needed something that was conducive to the life of a community um, minister and a student. Um, and Lyft seemed like a godsend and an answer. They advertised a job with this feature of flexibility that we wanna talk about uh, more later on. That allowed me to make more money uh, along with loaning me uh, a car. And I was in desperate need of that so-called flexibility um, in a car. Um, but over the years, as the number of bonuses decrease while the demands to complete rides increase, um, making major cuts to home pay, it was becoming increasingly difficult to sustain a living. Uh, signs of that good deal uh, never came. Uh, and it was painfully clear um, that my views of Lyft were shifting. Uh, more specifically, when COVID-19 hit um, and when uh, the movement began to build around Black Lives Matter, it became much more clear and pulled back the curtain showing America's diseases for which we still have no vaccine. I will say this, um, Ken has spoke to you a lot about what is the legislative impacts and I will talk with you, I will translate that about what that looks like on a daily for a Lyft driver. There is no flexibility um, for what it feels like to be deactivated when you're living paycheck to paycheck. Um, there's nothing flexible around collective bargaining. There's nothing um, flexible about having no zero sick days, no family leave, no workers' compensation. There's nothing flexible about not having unemployment insurance in the middle of a pandemic. There's nothing flexible about having your corporations lie to you. And there's certainly nothing flexible about not having protections um, when you're hurt or injured on the job. We must keep in front of us that these labor platforms um, that perform essential services were born from economic instability um, and that Folks like us, folks that look like me, that are low income, were willing to accept any work, um, even to bypass the important obligations and extend it, no commitment to safe a working amount. Um, and so that's what it looks like um, today for uh, a Lyft driver. And, and this is what we're currently dealing with. And as a, prop, as a former Proposition 22, I wanna go in to how they were able to pass this law. Um, they co-opted Black Lives Matter language. Um, they posted billboards, um, bringing in POCs, um, millions of dollars, over 200 millions of dollars to create illusions, perceptions to create an agenda of profit over people. Uh, voters in California were un unindated 
um, with misinformation and lies. And at the end of the day, most of the voters had buyer's remorse, approximately 40%. They incorporated various platitudes about their commitment to racial justice and black communities. Um, and they spent uh, millions. Oh, you went on mute, Sherry. I don't know why. I'll stop right there. It must have been <laughs> my time. <laughs> no, that's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. I think, you know, that's what a lot of our community of tech workers, you know, when we were going through the 2020 election, and I, I kind of have this woven into what we want to talk about today is I noticed that a lot of tech workers were coming to us and asking, what do we think about this proposition? And we were urging people to vote no, because like you said, companies were pouring millions of dollars into not just flooding the public with this information, but also their own employees and the drivers, right? And sending a lot of information through those channels. So I think sharing your experience um, in forums like this for, you know, in particular with tech workers is invaluable because we don't always get that information, right? Like we don't always know what the software, the algorithms, the <laughs> legislative moves actually translate to for people every day living in these platforms. So thank you for that. Um, Laura, you know, you mentioned in your introduction, and I know from working with you, you are an expert on how these structures and the various configurations that companies use for gig work, for contract work, for temp work have all come together to undermine labor protections and workers' rights. And I also know that you've been helping on these campaigns throughout the United States. Um, and I wonder if you could just talk about the patterns you've seen emerge. I know you worked really actively to stop Uber and Lyft from passing a Prop 22-like um, law in Massachusetts. And I wonder if you could just talk about what you see taking shape um, throughout the country and outside of California. Sure. So, you know, after Prop 22 passed, the, the companies were clear. They said publicly they wanted to replicate that Prop 22 model across the country. And, and that's what they've been trying to do. So we've seen them spend enormous sums in states pushing for legislative exemptions from state labor and employment laws, including minimum wage laws, state paid leave laws, and social benefit programs like unemployment insurance. So I could just kind of highlight a few examples of, of what we've seen. Um, a good example is what happened in New York in 2021. The app-based companies backed a collective bargaining bill that would have offered app-based drivers and delivery workers a collect collective bargaining rights at the state level. So a good thing. But in return, these workers would have been excluded from all nearly all state employment rights, including New York's $14 minimum wage, New York's paid leave laws and unemployment insurance and workers comp. So in essence, they, these workers would have had to bargain from nothing rather than bargaining from the minimum labor standards that all other employers have to bargain from that are set by state law. Now the collecting, the, the bill also preempted cities from legislating minimum labor standards for workers, which would have meant these workers couldn't ask, you know, go to New York City to, to improve their labor standards. And the collective bargaining rights the workers got were quite limited. I think the bill uh, prohibited them from striking. So it was unclear even how what leverage they would have to negotiate a strong agreement. So once the detail, details of that bill came out, a number of unions and worker centers spoke out against it and it didn't go anywhere. Um, I'll tell you another example is a law that did pass last year in Washington state. And that is a law that provided app-based drivers with a state deactivation center. So not a union, but essentially a central organization at the state level that would allow workers to challenge unfair deactivation. Again, a good thing. But once again, in return, drivers were deemed non-employees under this law. So that means they were excluded from Washington's very strong labor and employment rights and protections, including its $14 minimum wage, paid sick leave, unemployment insurance, and workers' comp. comp. And in return, they kind of similar to the Prop 22 model, got a limited and inferior set of rights and protections in return, including this kind of a minimum pay standard that was based only on time that 
uh, that a driver has a passenger in the car. So it doesn't include like, uh, less than half of their time, doesn't include the time they're going to pick up a driver, uh, uh, pick up a passenger, doesn't include their waiting time when they're waiting to be assigned. So really um, something that maybe looks right, like okay on paper, but then when you look at the details, it's that, that that's not gonna work out to like good pay. Uh, the Washington state law also preempts localities from legislating better labor protections for drivers. So essentially drivers lose Seattle as a critical kind of legislative target and Seattle has been really good legislating good standards for app-based workers. And that law did pass last year. And then finally we have Massachusetts. Massachusetts already has a really broad and strong standard in the law for determining who's an employee and who's an independent contractor. It had the ABC test. A couple of years ago, the Massachusetts AG sued Uber and Lyft for misclassifying its workers as independent contractors under state law. So rather than complying with the law, the companies did what, what they have been doing all over. They, had, they are spending untold sums fighting the lawsuit in court and while trying to change the law to seek exemptions from the labor and employment laws that apply to all other employers. So in Massachusetts, they sponsored a ballot initiative that's very similar to Prop 22. It would have deemed drivers and uh, app-based drivers non-employees under state law. And much like Prop 22, it would have uh, created a set limited and inferior set of rights and benefits in return, including kind of a minimum pay standard that's set at 120% of Massachusetts minimum wage which on its face seems like a good thing, higher than minimum wage, but again, as kind of as Ken was saying, that minimum pay standard doesn't account for all the time drivers work. Critically, uh, their waiting time, and it doesn't account for a lot of their costs either. So it's kind of like the devil's in the details and it's not, not as good as it seems. Um, and so there was a legal challenge to that ballot initiative and the court ruled that the that the um, ballot initiative violated the law that um, violated what's called the single subject rule because it it impacted both consumers and workers. So while you know I think that that ballot initiative did not go forward, we anticipate that it will. The companies will come back with a a new ballot initiative, you know, in the future, uh, potentially in, in 2024. So, and I'll also just say one other thing, you know, we've also seen corporate efforts to legislate exemptions from employment rights and protections beyond the traditional app-based gig workers like drivers and delivery workers. There was a ballot measure, measure introduced in California last year that sought to reclassify healthcare service providers, everyone from nurses to doctors to healthcare aides as independent contractors if they receive their assignments through an online platform or app and the online platform doesn't set their schedule. So the ballot measure never made it, you know, it never, it never continued on, it, it was rescinded, but it really shows where I think a lot of corporations want to take gig work. They want to get to a, to a place where they can assign shifts, assign work through apps, use technology to automate and invisibilize supervision and control, and then say, these workers don't have a boss, they should be considered independent contractors. And this has the potential to turn what is in many places, high quality and unionized work. I'm thinking of, you know, hotel housekeeping work or grocery store works, jobs where if you have a union, you, are, you get good wages, and benefits and a path to a secure retirement, turn those jobs into gig jobs with no security, no benefits, no way to retire with dignity. So not to end on a low note here, but there are some serious threats on the horizon. Absolutely. Um, and I think one of the things that I wanted to just sort of, Sherry, you talked about this a little bit earlier and what you're saying, but one of the things that's made these efforts, whether they're ballot initiatives or legislation, um, I think vulnerable to pu the public not understanding and supporting them was this argument around flexibility, right? And a lot of the things that you laid out, Sherry, of the way that the company sort of appropriated uh, social justice, you know, issues to try and underscore how they were moving these campaigns forward, how they were good for, you know, vulnerable communities. And, you know, I'm curious, you know, Sherry, you talked about sort of flex, all the things that flexibility isn't. I wonder, you know, from working and organizing with Gig Workers Rising and talking to drivers and other folks living in the 
and gig platform world, what do you hear from them? Like what's resonant with them? Is flexibility resonant? What do they want their work to look like? What, what are the calls from workers in terms of what they're hoping for? Well, Samantha, you bring up a really good point, and, and that's the stories of the workers, right? Unfortunately, we can't bring in thousands of workers for a one hour um, segment, but what we can do is what I can do is be the messenger and at least relay the information about what they're telling us. And so here in California, we performed a survey uh, for gig workers. Um, it was, went through 31 states, including the District of Columbia. Uh, it was 178 workers who filled out this report, which was really comprehensive. And this is what they said that um, is impacting them. 28% of them have been injured on the job while working, okay? 63% of them have ended a ride because they felt unsafe. 42% have experienced physical abuse. 82% uh, have experienced verbal abuse on a job. Uh, this is a significant number um, because within this percentage, uh, they have been accosted based on their gender, a skin color, uh, or religion. Uh, and 31% of them have been sexually harassed. Um, the answer is pretty clear. Um, whether or not you're behind a vehicle or behind a desk on a job, uh, workers want protections. They want fair wages, right? They want the ability to feel safe. Um, we also found out through um, our research that gig workers had performed a health and safety report that over 50 at workers have been murdered on the job since 2017 here in the United States. The actual number is, is probably higher. When we talk about workers, these are workers of color and their families are bearing the brunt. And our research shows more than 60% of the kill workers were people of color. Are they, although they comprise less than 29% of the overall workforce in the US economy. And now what I had mentioned before that these corporations uh, were engineered and created out of a form of economic instability. And what this will suggest is that there has been a historical form of economic exploitation targeted towards people of color. We're just seeing it come through corporations like Lyft and Uber. Um, so this is disappointing, yet not surprising. Workers want protections. They want the ability to organize. They want the ability to share their voice. They want the ability to come home um, into a housing secured place. Um, they want transparency and they want safety. Thank you. I think, you know, one of the things that stood out to me, I'm, you know, before joining Tech Equity, I talk about this a lot. I was a labor organizer for 13 years. And so one of the things that comes up a lot is, you know, folks are wondering, well, how important is classification, right? And as a labor organizer, it's hard to even evoke if you don't have the basics. People take for granted the basics, right? Minimum wage, health and safety, mm -hmm. like <laughs> workers comp benefits, all of that. If you don't have the basics, it is so hard to move one foot in front of the other. And I think a lot of people who haven't done this type of work don't fully grasp that. Um, and I can't imagine trying to fight for workers' rights without a basic floor, right? In negotiations, we always start, like Laura talked about, we always start with the floor of what the state laws are, the federal laws are. And the point is you can get above it. And so to go in with nothing is is so difficult. So just um, really thank you for bringing that perspective and what you're seeing with workers in the survey and the work that you all are doing is really important. And just to want to say one more thing, like thoughts and prayers are not enough. Right. Uh, we see this uh, around gun violence. We see this around poverty. What we know is that there is a template a basic model that is going nationwide that Laura and Ken has just suggested in which their bid rock model is to offload the risk onto workers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, workers generate millions of dollars of income for these giants and yet and still people are in poverty and it's impacting them and their families. Um, and it's time for a change. So thank you. Absolutely. I think that's actually a good segue to, you know, Laura, you brought this up a little bit, but 
I wanted to hear also from Ken, you know, I know the Labor Center has done incredible research on sort of the real minimum wage um, for, you know, drivers, but also just a lot of research around technology and the future of work. And, you know, Laura mentioned that this is not a phenomenon that's relegated just to, you know, driving or the taxi industry, let's say. It's expanded to healthcare, to mental health. You know, there's been a lot of reporting done on this. I wondered what you're seeing, what stands out to you, and what are the sort of manifest manifestations of the model that you think people need to start paying attention to and learning more about? Well, as, as, as Minister Murphy said so, so clearly, it's this model is based on the idea of, of shifting costs and risk to workers and shifting liability to the public um, or avoiding liability for what happens in those vehicles and avoiding li liability for uh, consumer liability. We have seen efforts to, to move into this direction. I mean, where you see the most of this, of course, is in driving. That's both driving passengers, delivery, food delivery, package delivery, um, as well as uh, domestic workers and sort of the, hand, the handy kind of model there. And what those areas have in common, as, as Minister Murphy said, is those are workforces that are heavily workers of color, and in many parts of the country, heavily undocumented immigrants. Um, there have been attempts to do this kind of model in, you know, in nursing, there was discussion about trying to do a ballot initiative in California. And I think nursing is a big challenge for them to move in this direction because we already have big visiting nurses programs where nurses are paid well, they're employees, they have rights, they get benefits. Um, and so the question would be, is there a market for nurses to want to move from that to, to some place where they do not have those same rights and benefits? There's also been an attempt to do this uh, in mental health, where from what I've seen, the apps charge as much as people would pay on the market, but what they're paying uh, is very low in, to the um, people who deliver the behavioral health. And again, right now there's a huge shortage in in the in behavioral health uh, workers, uh, therapists, and so again, it's not clear wh where and how there would be a strong market for what they're trying to do. On the other side, we are seeing an increase in the use of apps to fill employment gaps and allow for flexibility. It, some of that in, in retail, but it's being done as W two employees. And including in some union settings. And I think this is what's so important when we have these discussions about flexibility is there is nothing in the app model, there's nothing in the scheduling through an app model that requires that shift of risk and cost to workers and shedding of consumer liability. That is, these are two entirely separate things and there is no reason you can't have, and we do now have good examples of models where you have ability for for people to uh, choose times when they want to work and do throw use it using technology, but do it as an employee with those rights and with those rights and benefits. So it's important when we're talking about uh, what is, you know, what's expanding here. There's two pieces of it. There's one is the misclassification piece. Uh, and we tend to see that in labor markets where workers have a lot less power. And then the other is the the quote, flexibility piece, and that we can see can be done in ways that preserve workers' rights. Yep, absolutely. And I just want to remind folks, we're going to move to Q&A in a little bit. So if you have questions for the panelists, please make sure to put them in the Q&A function um, at the bottom of your screen. Um, thank you, you know, Ken, for that. I, yeah, I'm very interested to see where this goes. Um, and Laura, you and you know the National Employment Law Project, NELP, have been working on how this model is expanding at the federal level. And I wonder if you could talk some about the new coalition that we've seen forming that knits gig, gig companies with staffing companies that employ temp, temp workers and helped introduce federal legislation to enshrine a sub-minimum wage and lower labor standards um, for workers. Sure. So for a while now, you know, we at NELP have been warning that the app-based gig worker carve-out bills are just the beginning, and that more and more corporations would seek to exclude their workers from our labor and employment laws to offload responsibility 
uh, for the workers who power their businesses and their obligations to pay into social insurance systems. And we recently became aware of this corporate lobby group. It's called the Coalition for Workforce Innovation, whose members include the app-based platforms like Uber and DoorDash, but also temporary staffing companies like Kelly Services, retail giants, Target and, and um, Target and Walmart, trucking and delivery companies like XCO and FedEx, even tech companies like Facebook and Microsoft, all pushing this notion that workers want to be non-employees or independent contractors as a way to erode workplace power and labor standards. Their strategy seems to be kind of to popul popularize this kind of term independent work while obscuring how dangerous it is for millions of workers to lose basic labor and employment rights and protections. Um, and, you know, and they're also using adjectives like modern and innovative and saying that our labor employment, employment laws are outdated and that they're seeking to modernize them. But the reality is there's nothing special or innovative about how these companies operate. In a lot of cases, particularly with the app-based platforms, they're just, you're using technology to automate supervision and control of workers. And instead of a human boss, you have an algorithm assigning you work and surveilling how you perform the work. This, this, this Coalition for Workforce Innovation, CWI, is behind many of the legislative and legal efforts to roll back workplace standards. They were in a, the plaintiff in a lawsuit that sought to stop the Biden administration from withdrawing an independent contract, contractor rule that had been in, uh, promulgated by the Trump administration that essentially narrowed who would be considered an employee under the Fair Labor Standards Act. So they brought a challenge to the removal of that regulation and it was successful. They're also behind this kind of cartoonishly anti-worker bill that was introduced in the House of Representatives last summer. And it's really, it's very scary. It's, and it's really the kind of the clearest manifestation of that businesses across all industries wanna lower their labor costs by legislating the escape from minimum labor standards. So the bill is called the Worker Choice and Flexibility Act. And it says that if a worker enters into a so-called worker flexibility agreement with their employer or hiring entity, then the worker can reject uh, job offers without penalty. The catch is by virtue of these agreements, the worker is also excluded from coverage under federal minimum wage and overtime laws, the Fair Labor Standards Act, considered a non-employee for purposes of, of tax, the Internal Revenue Code, so the worker has to pay both the employer and the employee's share of federal payroll taxes that fund Social Security and Medicare. And also critically, they're also uh, excluded from all other federal, state, and local laws dealing with wages, benefits, of ta and taxes if based on the employment relationship. So what I think that last kind of catch-all means is that these agreements, if a worker enters into one of these worker flexibility agreements, they would also not be covered by state labor and employment laws that create additional rights and benefits for workers, including um, higher minimum wage laws, 30 states in DC have a wage high, higher minimum wage than 725, paid family and medical leave, 11 states in DC have some form of it, um, you know, record keeping and pay transparency laws at the state level that allow workers to, to that require employers to share information about pay and really help workers um, combat wage theft. And then critically, our social uh, safety net unemployment insurance and workers comp wouldn't apply either. So this bill would essentially allow employers to require workers to contract away fundamental bedrock rights and protections as a condition of getting work. So, I mean, I think it's no hyperbole to say this bill would take us back like a hundred years to before we had like any uh, legislative minimum standards to when there was the, what, uh, when there was freedom Freedom of contract trumps the basic notion of minimum labor standards and a social safety net. And it really is going to lead to a race to a bottom. It's obvious that the workers who would have to agree, who would, who would be most um, impacted by this, are the workers with the least bargaining power. 
those in underpaid and labor intensive work who are disproportionately black and immigrant workers. And so what this bill is doing is eliminating labor rights and protections for the workers who need them the most and legislating a race to the bottom on labor standards. Well, that is dark. Um, thank you for uh, updating us, Laura, because it is really scary and it's been um, terrifying to watch companies amass resources and continue to move forward. Um, and so, you know, I think uh, the only hope I take is, you know, folks that are organizing on the ground and, and figuring out how to actively push back. And like Sherry said, you know, thoughts and prayers are insufficient. And so um, I want to hear questions from the audience, but also want to make sure we close with what can people do? Um, how can people take action, support workers, support um, folks that are organizing? Um, so before we go there, I want to bring in our director of content, Marianne Wellington, who I think will lead us through questions from the audience for all of you panelists. So take it away, Marion. Sweet. Thank you all so much for this conversation. Um, it's been really generative and I feel like I'm learning a lot. So thanks. Um, we had a question from the audience. Let me just pull it up real quick. Um, that asked, right? Thing went away. Um, someone asked, were gig workers in California being treated as employees before Prop 22 passed? Uh, the companies were not treating gig workers as employees before Prop, Prop, Prop 22 passed. In individual cases, the Department of Labor Standards Enforcement had ruled in multiple cases through that period that they should have been. Uh, there were various lawsuits that the companies settled, and because of uh, mandatory arbitration, which makes it difficult to do class action lawsuits, uh, we, they, the companies continue to act with impunity, even though they had, they, they had a, a whole history of being rulings going in the other direction. Uh, and it wasn't once AB5 was passed in California that clearly laid out a very clear test uh, of employment status. At that point, the state attorney general sued for injunctive relief to have workers declared uh, as employees. And then we had the passage of, of Proposition 22. So if it's declared unconstitutional, uh, then we go back to those legal cases uh, seeking injunctive relief and seeking to stop the companies from their illegal practices. But I think it's been clear from the very beginning I mean, the, 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 the earliest DLSE cases on this were not long after the company started. Their whole strategy has been to ignore the law, pretend it doesn't apply to them, talk in these futuristic terms about how we're the future and if you oppose us, you're you know, anti-technology, and then try to build the political power to change the laws they don't like. And I think it's a very dangerous world and direction where companies are able to basically flout the law, act in complete violation of the law, and then amass the resources to write their own laws uh, that govern themselves in their own interest, not in the interest of the public. I also just wanna mention, cause it hasn't been brought up yet, but one of the things that I found most appalling in the language of Proposition 22, um, Ken brought up a, a part of it, but it, ha it had written in that the legislature can't overturn the provisions of the law without a seven eighths majority. That doesn't exist for anything in, in state law, not even constitutional amendments have that high of a threshold. And so, and we're seeing this play out. I don't want to take us too far afield, but we're seeing this play out, not just with gig work, right? But we saw it in this year's election in California with companies like DraftKings writing ballot initiatives that would carve laws specifically to, pro to you know, gain profit for them, taking money from, you know, our Native American communities and just, you know, sort of shaping laws and their image by spending tons, millions of dollars to sort of confuse the public about what it is. And, you know, there's also an argument to be made around Prop 30 that we saw this year where there was an environmental law that was passed and then companies tried to carve a ballot initiative where they could take public funds to meet their legal obligation. Um, so I just... I wanted to add that um, this pattern isn't just relegated to gig work. It's as we watch companies amass 
unprecedented levels of resources, they are using them to craft our legal uh, frameworks to benefit them. Um, so that's troubling. Troubling indeed. And speaking of other market conditions, um, someone asked about uh, how we've been seeing a lot of tech uh, layoffs in the tech space uh, and are wondering how does this potentially looming economic downturn impact gig workers and the advocacy for their rights? Sherry, I don't know if you have thoughts about this or seen any, you know, trickles of this in your work yet. Otherwise, I'm happy to also talk about this. Um, only just from my own personal experience. Um, as um, someone who in 2008 uh, fell under the economic um, collapse of the Great Recession, right? And looking for employment um, based on my education and could not find a job in Asian workers. Um, and so what I see this um, and what I've read in the papers is that there is an increase in the gig economy. More and more people have been seeking gig work to supplement the cost of inflation, pay for their food, to pay for uh, their housing. Um, and so uh, we now see it, uh, I will now see it becoming bigger, that the promise of flexibility, the promise of entrepreneurship will come to light, um, that that will not be the case. So while we see, while I perceive or would suggest that there will be an increase in the gig economy, in the gig economy, what I'll also see is an opportunity to tell the real story about how it's important to have these corporations regulated. Great. Um, we just had a question pop in. I think, Laura, this one's best for you. Um, someone just said that they've been working as a contractor for a while, being paid through Upwork, doing work no different than salaried employees at a company in SF. Um, they said that they would prefer to be salaried. And they're asking, um, what can I do and who can I talk to if I feel like I may be misclassified? So just to be clear, this is someone who's being employed as an independent contractor. I don't know for a contractor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, different. yeah I mean, this. yeah. I mean, I... Uh, that's it's this is a huge issue. Um, I'm happy to talk to this person afterwards and see, you know, if they could prefer them to someone in California to talk to some more. But you know, I more and more we're seeing companies use models. I like calling people independent contractors, but sometimes hiring them through temp staffing agencies where they're the employee of the temp agency. And these 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 structures create like a second tier workforce, which is what I think this person is talking about here, where you have folks who are doing the same work as permanent direct hire employees, but for less pay, no benefits, no security. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's a really pervasive thing. And it sounds like, you know, this person could potentially be misclassified. I mean, I can't say, you know, just based on everything here, but if they're doing the same work as a salaried person, you know, there, there's that, that could very well be the case. Thank you. Well, I wanna make sure, I wanna take, um, uh, what is it, chair privilege, whatever the Robert Rules of Order is and say, uh, I'm, I would really like to have an opportunity for our panelists to just say, um, you know, we have tech workers in our community, both that are, you know, live joining this event, but also will watch the recording and clips afterwards. If if there are things that you all would like to see folks take action on, pay attention to, learn more about, use their voice on, do you have any, you know, sort of calls to action or things you want to bring to the attention of our community? And I'll open it up for anyone that has things they want to share. I do. Go ahead. I'm always um, wanting to pitch this in. Um, I read an article the other day around the not only the importance of uh, making sure that there's a redistribution of resources as relates to these companies, um, but also the ability uh, for folks to have self-determination. Um, I say all this to say is that, um, you know, uh, people of color need to be trusted with their experiences. Those mostly impacted need to be trusted with their experiences, their thoughts and methodologies, uh, because we have a worldview uh, which can support us in freeing uh, what I would coin as a theology of profit over people. Um, and in order for, for us to deal with that and deal with that in a really radical way is to talk about race, 
with those folks on the table and be able to incorporate those experiences, not only um, as we go out into the field uh, and address uh, the unregulated guilt um, uh, at base companies, but also how we are approaching, how we are healing this world. Um, we gotta remember that um, as we saw um, the height of Black Lives Matter movement um, after George Floyd, that this is not only about police killings and terror, it's about every institution that exploits and abuses black and brown people in this country. Um, and so when it comes to Lyft and Uber and their cronies, they're experts. Um, and we need to just get it together and deal effectively and talk about race. Absolutely, thank you. I wanted to end on a little bit of, I, I think I, I get very doom and gloom in these conversations and I just kind of wanted to bring something in that, that gives me hope. Um, you know, I see a lot of really great worker organizing going on around the country. There are groups in Colorado, California, New York, Illinois, Massachusetts, Washington state, that are demanding transparency from the companies, um, that they, you know, how much that they know how much they're going to make, how much they're going to, the companies are charging uh, the consumers that are legislating good pay standards that don't require uh, workers to trade away basic employment rights and protections in the process. So there's a lot of really good stuff going on uh, on the ground, and that make that makes me hopeful. I'll also say that you know I think. There are some federal administrative opportunities in the next couple of years. The Biden administration is revisiting its standard for determining who's an employee uh, and who's an independent contractor in the Fair Labor Standards Act, which sets a minimum wage of $7.25 an hour. That's no small thing when we talk about how many gig workers don't even make $7.25 an hour, right? So potentially broadening that rule is the first step to getting real enforcement so so folks in this industry have a baseline i would say my you know as a lawyer my call to action if you're interested anyone can comment on this rule you don't have to be a lawyer you don't you can have you can comment from your own personal experience uh working as an independent contractor uh and you know they're accepting comments on this i think till december 13th and just quickly yeah Thanks for doing this, Samantha. And I just say, yeah, support, call to action, be support the, the gig worker organizations, support groups like, like NELP and support people who are working to unionize around the country right now and build the kind of power that it'll take uh, to change things. Absolutely. And we will um, send a follow up email to everyone that attended today, as well as post the a recording of this event on our website with resources. So we'll make sure to send resources on some of the work that folks have mentioned and also um, some of the great you know, folks that are organizing like Gig Workers Rising and Rideshare Drivers United and other folks that I think would love to, if you have financial means to have your financial support, as well as, you know, one of the great things you can do is just sign up to these groups lists, right? Because they have opportunities often, like Laura just mentioned, where you can submit comments, you can take action, you can sign up with Tech Equity if you haven't already. We do call-ins to legislative actions. We do a lot of support and me too's for things like this. So um, make sure you subscribe to these groups and learn from them mm -hmm. on social media and on their email lists. And with that, I just want to thank all three of you for bringing your expertise and your experiences and generously sharing with our community. We value you so much and the work that you're doing. And I want to thank everyone who joined us today or who's watching this um, after the fact. Um, and like I said, please, um, if you believe in this work as we do, um, figure out within your means how you can support it, whether that's you know a financial contribution to us or other organizations working on these issues, joining lists, volunteering, whatever you have the capacity to do, we need you. Um, everyone needs to come into this fight. It is big, it is gnarly, and appreciate everyone for being a part of this conversation. Thank you all so much.